so welcome uh, to this uh, edition of Fiki Fast Forward. Uh, we are delighted to have with us uh, today uh, Mr. Manish Sabarwal. He is the chairman and co-founder of Team Lee's Services. Uh, he is also the co-founder of ICAP India Limited and also an operating partner of Gaja Capital. He is on a few industry boards, but more importantly, is also on the board of the Reserve Bank of India. Uh, in a sense, he's um, been educated in Delhi, a product of the Shiram uh, College of Commerce, and then been to Wharton in Pennsylvania. Uh, so both India and US educated. Uh, prolific uh, writer, great thinker, uh, has a 360 uh, degree view on uh, a majority of items, in fact, on everything, and really has a way with words. And I often actually say, you know, I wish I could write one fourth as good as he does, uh, his thought process. And we're delighted, Manish, that you could be with us in this uh, edition of Fiki Fast Forward. A very warm welcome to you. Thanks. Thank you, Dilip. So, you know, I, I would just like to begin, uh, you know, and this is something that you talked about uh, much earlier, and you've been very passionate about it, is, you know, one of the big challenges today is how COVID is actually impacting the world of work. Your company also is deeply involved in the world of work. So how do you see the impact of COVID on the world of work? And what is it that we need to do uh, as a nation or as, as the global economy to address these issues? See, I... I think my vantage is informed by, you know, where you stand on an issue depends on where you sit. You know, as a company, or I work for a company that has hired somebody every five minutes for 15 years, but only hired 5% of the kids who came to us for a job. So that's always kept me thinking that, you know, unemployability seems to be a bigger problem than unemployment. But as I also looked in the job market, I quickly realized that employed poverty was a bigger problem than unemployment. Now, let me explain that because everybody thinks that India's official unemployment rate is a fudge and that it's very high. Officially, India's unemployment rate has stayed between six and 9% since independence, and it's not a fudge. But obviously, all of us intuitively recognize that we have a problem with poverty. So India's problem is employed poverty, or let me frame it as we don't have a jobs problem, we have a wages problem. I think that framing is important because if you think India has a jobs problem, you'll throw money from helicopters, you'll mandate a three-day work week, you'll take away people's tractors and give them spoons. But I think that our problem is wages. That means everybody who wants a job has a job, but they definitely don't have the wages they need or they want to pull out of poverty. So if you think it's wages, you'll do formalization, urbanization, industrialization, financialization, and human capital. Now, this is a really different path to travel down by for reforms, you can, because most people will say, Bhuka nanga pyasa, what are you talking about? The patient is in the ICU. I'm like, if the patient is in the ICU every day, somebody's got to tell him to quit smoking or lose weight. So I, in, I think that for 70 years, if we keep saying that our unemployment is 6%, we, need, we don't need more cooks in the kitchen now, we need a different recipe. So I would submit we need to raise the number of cities that we have with more than a million people. Today it's only 52. We define urbanization as shoving more people into Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore. That's not going to work. We need to raise the number of firms which are formal. Today we only have 22,500 companies with a paid up capital of more than 10 crores. That has to go up a lot. We need to raise our credit to GDP ratio from 50% to 100%. And of course, we need to reduce the number of farmers because 45% of our labor force in farming only generates 15% of our GDP. So the only way to help farmers is to have less farmers. And obviously, the other logical thing is we need to skill, educate our people. So I would submit that um, maybe there was... Uh, the 1955 Avadi resolution or the 1956 second five-year plan after independence sort of kneecap competition and assumed that the state would take the lead in the economy. Maybe that was the right decision at that point in time. But 1991 was a revolution, but there were three or four things left out. 
and those are the ones we're talking about corruption was left out banking was left out education was left out and agriculture was left out and hopefully it's time that we're addressing them now so you know it's very interesting that you talk about uh, education labor and banking and agriculture now in the current context right we have a new national education policy and you know you earlier you have been on record that the uh, education policy has been actually blocked by uh, vested interest and purists and others like that so how do you view the nep right and will it you know uh, i mean help in addressing the issues that you had identified in the jobs and in the talent and in the human capital scenario in india i absolutely think so i think you know gandhi ji had identified something called nayi taleem in 1943 at an education conference in varta which was basically about vocational and experiential education that was not that didn't find place in 1948 radha krishnan report nor in the 1968 kotari committee nor in the 1986 new education policy but vocational training creativity interdisciplinary letting go of the license raj in of universities so it really is purna swaraj for indian higher education i don't think it's it it addresses everything that we wanted but you know life is second best at best so i really think that the national education policy of 2020 i don't think you should take 15 years to give universities purna swaraj as the as the policy thinks about but i think we can do it in five so for a long time india's human capital was handicapped by university regulators who confused university buildings with building universities who sort of thought private schools were a part of the problem rather than part of the solution who thought that vocational training was only for dropouts of um school or college so my submission is that um you know the social signaling value of college education has always been higher than vocational training but college isn't what it used to be i mean 60% of taxi drivers in korea have a college degree 45% of um 31% of us retail checkout clerks have a college degree and 15% of high end security guards have a college degree but if we can combine what educators parents students and employers are looking for is one third iti one third employment exchange and one third college but that was never possible that innovation because of the regulatory cholesterol so yes i absolutely think that the national education policy if implemented as envisaged would allow many people in both the private and public sector to innovate and to create cost quality and quantity so in the past education regulators think seem to think that those people who deliver quality can't deliver quantity those people who have high cost can't deliver quantity my sense is that was a false um, uh, model which um, held back innovation but then became a self fulfilling prophecy right so my submission is that actually and we can talk about that later that education reform agricultural reform and labor reform are closely related um because it flows from the thesis that india doesn't have a jobs problem we have a wages problem but absolutely the nep is a is a is an important change for human capital now bureaucratic worst instincts always come out during execution of new laws so hopefully we will keep the bureaucratic civil service um under check and ensure that nep is implemented in the structure form and philosophy that the report says but i am quite hopeful that that will happen because it has come genuinely ground up this has not been a top down exercise where people were told it it was lakhs of people contributed to nep and that makes it a much more sustainable and scalable reform you know so you talked about uh, uh, agriculture uh, employment and education reform so you know you've talked about education just now and you know if mm-hmm. i go back to one of your articles you actually wrote there that india has perhaps one of the most toxic labor law regimes anywhere in the world and you know recently uh, last in, in last november we actually had one court passed recently the three other courts have been passed by parliament uh, do you feel that this is a very significant step uh, going forward and does this uh, actually contribute to making the regime more favorable or uh, you feel that the employee benefits have been skewed in a different way that it may not yield the desired results how do you view the current set of uh, 
you know labor reforms see india's labor is handicapped without capital and our capital is handicapped without labor we don't have a jobs problem we have a wages problem of course the four labor codes will adversely affect 5 to 10% of traditional labor market aristocracy but it will help 90% of the labor force you know it is the job of public policy to take the difficult path of the greatest good for the greatest number and in the past what has happened is vested interests have basically job preservation is not a form of job creation job preservation is more interesting to old people than young people so absolutely i think that um you know there's a wonderful new biography of dada bhai naroji where he is described as being too moderate for the radicals and too radical for the moderates and i think that that is really where we've ended up with labor reform we haven't ended up with pure hire and fire but we've ended up with a lot more flexibility but we have also not ended up with defending the status quo see in my mind there are over the last week since the labor codes have been passed a lot of people regret the status quo and still defend the status quo you can't do both you have to make up your mind on whether the status quo is working for 90% of india's kids and i would submit that we have enough evidence now over the last sort of many decades that job preservation is not a form of job creation and that we are clearly um ending up in a situation where job creation will be very important so you know, interestingly in, in while talking about this you talked about capital right and uh, you know uh, how do you see is there enough capital available is the banking system structured to deliver that capital or do we need certain reforms and certain initiatives really in this space uh to actually go forward so you know what are your views you've written about in the past in the current situation uh is it getting more accentuated is getting more uh, you know uh, urgent Um, what are your views and what should be done see india has about 140 lakh crore of bank deposits and we have about 100 lakh crores of bank credit outstanding so bank credit is about 50% of gdp um it is a really no number for a country at our stage of development it's lower than iran it's equal to bangladesh even though i would submit our economy is much more sophisticated than those two places and so we need to not be simplistic about it we don't want to do what we did between 2008 and 14 when bank credit went from 18 lakh crores to 54 lakh crores and then we ended up with 14 lakh crores of bank to, of bad debt what we need to think about is how do we systemically slowly and consciously and sustainably raise bank credit and i would submit there are five things we need to do one is we need to issue a lot more bank licenses you know in 1970 in 1947 when india became independent we only had 97 banks we only have 94 banks now i mean we need many more banks so we need to raise that we need to raise the governance in private sector banks there the management is so powerful that the board and shareholders are weak we need to raise the governance in public sector banks there the shareholder is so powerful that the management and the board are weak um and most importantly we have put 2 lakh crores into nationalized banks in the last 2 years um their risk weighted assets are lower than what it was 2 years ago it makes no sense i mean you know the ministry of skills their budget is only 4000 crores the ministry of central government allocation is for is 52000 crores to primary education i mean ye mazak hai kya bhushan steels has more loans than india central government allocation to primary education that should be unacceptable to a country when you put in 2 lakh crores into nationalized banks you have 2 lakh crores yet less for investment in health skills and education so fixing private sector bank governance fixing public sector bank governance issuing more bank licenses rbi raising its game in regulation and supervision and ending the distinction between banks and non banks because upi the payment revolution in india reaching a billion payments a month would not have happened without non banks so I, i i don't think there are any villains here they are victims i think msmes and migrants would have had less of a pain in covid if we had a higher credit to gdp ratio see formal enterprises have behaved more honorably than informal enterprises in covid because they can because they have access to credit right so i would submit that in the, at least a realization that i have had in the last 5 years 
is that financialization is a really, really important part of raising India's productivity and wages. And I think that the current regime is not um, on the front foot. It's not playing on the back foot. You know, our choices must reflect our hopes rather than our fears. And in banking, our choices always seem to reflect our fears that there will be another Yes Bank, there will be another um, big cycle of NPAs. We will figure out how to deal with that, but we can't hold back the financialization of the economy. And I think that it's time for us to have um, a really aggressive plan to raise competition and to raise the financial inclusion in Indian economy without believing that financial inclusion leads to financial instability. So, you know, you, you, you briefly uh, touched upon uh, the uh, area of uh, reform and you, know, you talked also about the skill space. So just taking a slight detour before I come back to the reforms program, what, you know, uh, you've also talked about the need to change the whole system of skilling. You know, you've talked about the types of the skilling university in Gujarat versus Delhi University in both the cases you actually took a disclaimer saying one you're an alma mater and the other you're a co-founder. So what needs to be done in this space in the high in the in in in, in the skilling space to actually uh, make the people of India a little more ready for the world of work in the future? I mean, I think the most important part is we have to innovate in in financing. See, there's a market failure in skill development. Companies are not willing to pay for training or candidates. They're willing to pay a premium for trained candidates. Candidates are not willing to pay for training. They're willing to pay for a job. Banks or microfinance aren't willing to lend to the candidate. And training companies are unable to fill up their classrooms. So while there are three legs of any skilling program, it's delivery, it's financing, and it's assessment and certification, I think that we have had a lot of work and a lot of development on skilling delivery, on skilling assessment. But skill financing continues to be a challenge. And maybe, you know, this is a global market failure. The German Minister of Vocational Training has had a bet with me that employers can't manufacture their own employees. You know, it, it, all over the world, employers are given trained employees and they can repair them or they can add some last mile skills, but they can't prepare them. So, so if we distinguish between repair and prepare, but I think that, you know, degree linked apprenticeships may be an important part of the future of education because, of course, they innovate in the social signaling value, but they also innovate in financing. And so our view is at least that employed learners will cross full-time learners in India's higher education system in the next 10 years. Degree-linked apprenticeships because of their financing innovation actually will make a huge difference. And you need all four classrooms, online classrooms, on-site classrooms, on the job classrooms and on-campus classrooms. And you need full connectivity between certificate, diploma, advanced diploma and degree. I think NEP finally allows us to do that. You know, UGC has had an antibiotic reaction to skill universities like us for the last five years. But my sense is that was an incomplete view of the world. So I think that the worlds of higher education skilling will converge in ways that regulators will not be able to process just because that's what kids, parents and employers want. So I think that um, you can take the number of apprentices in India from four lakh to 10 million if you stop viewing apprenticeships as a job on a diet, and apprenticeships are a classroom on steroids. And I think that that is not something the Ministry of Labor thinks about. And, and so um, you, need, you need boundarylessness thinking between Ministry of Skills, Ministry of Labor, and Ministry of HRD. Some of it is starting to emerge, but I think NEP demonstrates that boundarylessness. So I am quite confident that if the regulators got out of our way, just our own skill university, which has gone from zero to one lakh students in the few years that has been operational, can easily go to five, 10 lakh students. And hopefully there will be many other skill universities like us, which are driven by the scale and innovation of the private sector, but still manage to overcome the trust deficit. See, the problem we have in universities is not, government universities have an execution deficit, private sector universities have a trust deficit, and nonprofit universities have a scale deficit. So, so it's clear to me now that we will be able to do that. I think we're at the cusp of where 
employers are ready, kids are ready, parents are ready, and for sure, um, education institutions are ready. You know, I, I think one also fact that you have constantly brought before is about the need for data, uh, whether it is relating to any data or government data. You've related it in the in the in the uh, in in the context of you know the budget and expenditure. And now, if you look at even the RBI, they are saying we are unable to give uh, projections and inflation and take decisions with data. So, how important is data going forward, and what do we need? as a country to do to ensure that you know it is a bedrock uh, of our growth and you know of our literally you know can we dominate the world in data processing and data analytics etc like we started doing the bpo space in the 90 late 90s and early 2000s the two I questions mean, the, first of all the ministry of skills budget uh, is only 100 crores for, for all the data that we put out. So obviously we need a much more better funded, we need a much higher staff, and we need a much higher human capital in our Ministry of Skills and Program Implementation. I guess there are two confusions with data. One is during COVID, nobody has data because they were unmodelable, right? So I think that I have my, my challenges with the CMIE data of 8% unemployment in March, 28% in April, back to 8%, and now at 6.2% is, it's sort of ma microscopically precise, but macroscopically confused. I mean, that's like saying on Sunday, unemployment is 75%. I mean, your office is closed, right? So, so I think that there is a challenge with sort of data in the COVID environment is we, we confront uncertainty. I mean, we don't confront risks. The risk is when you can plot the probabilities. So all models are incomplete, but some models are useful. So I think that the challenge for us with labor market data has been this fight between administrative data and sample data. Economists always seem to think that sample surveys are better, but you know, our official household survey, 20, you know, 29% of Indians say they work for an employer with more than eight employees, but only 1.5 employers percent of employers say they have more than eight employees. So uh, I think that the, we have to reconcile the supply and demand side, which always doesn't happen. So I think that the capability in India for data analytics, for data warehousing, for primary research is quite substantial. But again, this will be a case where the public and private sector will have to work together, just like skill universities in the government sector haven't worked, but skill universities where public private partnerships have been there have worked. I would submit the CMI has made a beginning, but we need to make, you know, we need to take our budget of our Ministry of Statistics to 500 crores from 100 crores. We need to take their human capital up because without which we are all flying blind. I mean, you know, policy is not the solving of a sum. It is the painting of a picture. I would sort of acknowledge that. But I think that too many of our decisions um, which have long-term implications today are made without any sort of basis and other than intuition. I think that works at some level, but the Indian economy is now getting too complex. We're already teaching $3 trillion. I mean, we will cross Japan and Germany, so we'll be the third largest in the world. I think we can't be flying blind or making decisions based on intuition anymore. And this is exactly where I would bring in civil service reform also because it's related to the, the civil service, the generalist permanent civil service, which is whose knowledge is usually a mile wide inch deep is not always comfortable with data, right? They keep moving from position to position and they don't always spend their life in one domain and develop um, the inch wide mile deep knowledge. So I would submit some of the aversion to data and the lack of data investments also reflects a permanent generalist civil service, which we need to reform if India has to reach its destiny in the long run. So, you know, uh, I think um, you've also talked about and, you know, what what is your view about, you know, going forward? Uh, you know, uh, in the context of climate change, you actually used a very interesting phrase that, you know, you need a climate change for our entrepreneurs, firms and citizens. And you, you use the word in this uh, earlier on about Purna Suraj. So what could the government and what could firms do going forward? to actually, uh, you know, uh, take the, uh, the reforms that have been announced so far to their logical conclusion, also take other steps like you mentioned 
to change the trajectory of India and the trajectory of the people of India? See, we have created the world's largest democracy on the infertile soil of the world's most hierarchical society. We have a real chance, a new national goal should be, is to create that our grandchildren should live in the world's largest economy. I don't say that lightly. We could do that if we reached a per capita income of $15,000 because of the demographics of China and America. So I think it's time for India to say we have a new national goal. Our grandchildren will live in the world's largest economy at one level. But most importantly, at a second level, what COVID has reminded us is that per capita income matters more than total GDP. So per capita GDP matters more than total GDP. We are today fourth in, per, in total GDP, but we are 138th in per capita GDP. China's GDP per capita is now four times more than us, even though it was the same in 1950. Korea's GDP is 20 times us, even though it was the same in 1960. China was the same in 1995. So I would submit that we can be the world's largest economy in the lives of our grandchildren. But for that, we have to firmly recognize that poverty is about productivity, the productivity of our firms, the productivity of our states, and the productivity of our individuals. Now, states is obvious. I live in Karnataka. My parents live in UP. Both of us have the same GDP, but Karnataka has one-fourth the number of people than UP, which means we are four times more productive than UP, um, just within the same country, right? Forget about it. And, and this can be seen at various levels, right? California's GDP is equal to India. Pakistan's GDP is equal to Maharashtra. Um, so these are with very different populations so and different sizes. So productivity of geographies or regions matter. Productivity of firms matter. There's a 24 times difference in productivity in manufacturing between firms at the 90th and 10th percentile. And obviously, productivity with individuals matters. Feet on street, financial services, liabilities. I pay 8,000 and I pay 45,000 to a kid the same age and job description exactly the same. <laughs> but the salary is four times or five times different based on soft skills and hard skills. So I think that once India recognizes that there's nothing cultural about our poverty, it is just a matter of productivity of our cities, of our firms and our individuals, the path in front of us is clear. We just formalize more and more. We financialize more and more. We urbanize more and more. We industrialize more and more. And we skill more and more. And this is not a problem like cancer or climate change. This is, this is genuinely a plumbing problem. I mean, we know exactly what to do in all those areas. Obviously, as the protests in the last one week about agriculture and education and even a certain level labor show, that you will have to confront the vested interests in the vocal minority because nobody cuts the tree they're sitting on. You know, you, a vote can't mean a veto. You know, labor trade unions have vetoed labor laws for so long that it has been unfair to 90% of India's labor force. But trade unions are a minority. We need to, they, they deserve a place at the table. We should listen to them. But in the end, we can't allow a minority rule in labor where old people, trade union people, control the fate of the youngest country in the world. So I think there is a structural window in India over the next 25 years, because there is a new world of work, new world of education, and new world of organizations. There is a global window where there is a capital glut, there is China fatigue, and the politics has become toxic in aging countries. And there is a domestic window where we are young population, very far from the productivity frontier, and hopefully lower corruption in wholesale level. So I am quite clear that this global structural and domestic window really are a unique time to India. You know, when I landed in 1994 in the US in August, there was a front page article on the Wall Street Journal which said that India is more interesting than important. I hope that journalist is eating the newspaper on which he wrote that, because I think in the next 25 years, what's happening in India isn't once in a decade or once in a millennium. It's really once in the lifetime of a country. But the political courage to do civil service reform, soon after labor reform, the political courage to do compliance reform, the political courage to give more power to state governments, you know, 29 chief ministers matter more than one prime minister, is really, really important. So I think while I'm 
delighted with the reforms of education, agriculture, and labor, which are connected, I hope we'll quickly follow them up with civil service, compliance, banking, and urbanization. So, you know, you talked about a 15,000 uh, per capita GDP for a grandchildren. What is your ambition in the next five years, let's just say? What do you think? I mean, I, th I think we will have to hold on till we know whether we are at the end, middle, or sort of beginning of COVID, because um, obviously that has changed the trajectory. But... I, I think that it's eminently possible for us to reach somewhere between seven and 10,000 based on how long COVID lasts, what impact COVID has on global trade. India is just very, very attractive investment destination in a world where 25% of the world's bonds now trade at negative or zero interest rates. So 19 trillion bonds now trade at zero or negative interest rate. So when fixed income becomes no income, you will overvalue growth, which means that you will value India because we are the only country in the world with more than 100 million people that has 20 years of growth ahead of us. So I think we can set off an investment super cycle by signaling to the world. See, a lot of people's response to COVID is blow up the fiscal blow up monetary policy. I don't think we can afford, so if we can't afford money to throw from helicopters, at least we can offer our citizens change. And I think if we change, seven to $10,000 is absolutely possible, but our grandkids could live in the world's largest economy. Well, thank you, uh, Manish, for that extremely uh, positive, uh, you know, uh, ending to a very in-depth and very insightful, uh, uh, you know, and very inspiring uh, conversation that Tiki uh, passed forward. I think uh, three major takeaways uh, for me, uh, reforms are good, uh, we need to execute them and do more in the areas that you have actually suggested. You talked about formalization, uh, financialization, urbanization, and, you know, skills uh, and one more. And of course, you have most importantly uh, talked about the vision uh, of maybe, you know, even if you go to 7,000, it's more than doubling uh, per capita, nearly tripling a per capita GDP in the next uh, five to seven years. And then, you know, for our grandchildren to uh, double it further to $15,000, uh, know, we are talking about per capita uh, income in India. And, you know, not uh, make it interesting, but make India important and relevant in the world as we go forward. Thank you very much for your time today. And I'm sure we will take this conversation forward in many other ways. So thank you very much, Manish. Take care, Dilip. Good luck. Godspeed.